I'm guessing as we talk, as we talk about the four main characters that I'm focusing on this week, uh, this is the one that I think of the Sesame Street song. One of these things is not like the others. One of these things just doesn't belong. Because uh, Columbus doesn't seem to fit with France of Assisi and, you know, Augustine, people like that, Luther. Uh, but, and he's probably the character in which, in some ways, he's the most controversial. We were talking about that before class here a moment ago. Most of you, I'm guessing, grew up at a time when Christopher Columbus was a hero, right? That's what you were taught in school. His heroic tra uh, travels, his heroic journey. And, uh, but most kids today, when they think of Columbus, they think of genocide. Yeah. You know, they think of, of uh, colonialism. And we, talk about, we talk about Rome falling to the barbarian invasions. That's what they think of Columbus. Because you had this peaceful society in the Americas, and then Spain came and just, you know, things fell apart. Which is it? You know, is he a hero? Is he a villain? Uh, well, we'll talk about that a little bit. But before we do, we need to set the stage. Now, speaking of heroes and villains, by the way, uh, Tim and I are going to take our show on the road. You know, so if you want to book the Tim and Terry show for your church or potluck or bar mitzvah or something, talk to our, our, our agents and we'll set you up. <laughs> Trying to break new ground here. Get into your areas. Oh, and by the way, we've got to hurry because we got to cover... This is what we're covering in the next 50 minutes, okay? Right here. All right? So, fasten your seatbelts, put your seat backs and trays in an upright locked position because we're on a roll. You set the stage. 1271, as Tim talked about, Marco Polo uh, and his one of his father, Niccolo, and his uncle, Maffeo, uh, to what we know as, as China today, to visit the great Khan, the Kulai Khan, his great court, which of course set the stage for Samuel Taylor Coleridge's famous poem, is Anadu to Kublai Khan a stately pleasure dome decree, where Alf the sacred river ran through caverns measureless to man down to a sunless sea. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. And uh, so, you turn me down? Yeah, there was a hum. Okay. You're good now. That was me humming. You're way louder than Tim. Okay. I had more caffeine than Tim this morning. <laughs> now, the, part of the important part of the story is that Niccolo and Raphael, they went to visit the court of the Khan earlier, and he sent them back in their travels, and the Khan asked them to bring with him, when they returned, 100 priests, 100 learned Christian scholars to teach about the Christian religion. This is the Khan. This is, he's open to this. He asked the Pope for this. And the Pope, well, he was kind of busy doing other things right about that, that time. And so, no, we can't really spare a hundred. Tell you, I'll tell you, send these two Franciscan friars. So on the journey back, this, now we've got Niccolo and Maffeo and Marco, the son, going with them on this journey. They take two Franciscan priests with them, or friars, and those priests turn back because the journey was tough. We're talking three years of walking through some of the most inhospitable land on earth. So you got to cut him some slack there. Uh, but so you have to wonder, what would have happened if 100 priests had shown up at the court of the Khan? Yeah. Wow, how that might have affected world history. Well, you know who else wondered that? Christopher Columbus. But we'll get there. So Marco Polo, he spent uh, about 17 years um, uh, in the court of the Khan. And uh, uh, he, he's traveling around, according to the story, seeing all the great expanses of China. He's seen the greatest that China has to offer. The huge, massive empire at this point. Uh, the Khan had all kinds of wealth and money on his flag. And Polo got to see it all. He's traveling throughout the kingdom and seeing the various peoples and uh, cultures available. Well, he returned in 1295. Okay, so this is where he was traveling all this time. Returned all the way back to Venice in 1295. And when he arrived in Venice, he found Venice was at war with Genoa. Small, you know, another town not far away from Italy. And so he joined the war, Venice against Genoa. He's captured in the battle and spent some time in prison. So while he's in prison, don't know what to do, he's got a cellmate there with him, Rusticello, who used to write novels. And so he would say, tell me, Marco, about your travels. And so Marco would tell the stories of his travels throughout the Far East. Aristotle is writing this stuff down and later publishes a book. Marco Polo gets out of prison and dies a few years later, but the book becomes an international bestseller. Uh, we know it as The Travels of Marco Polo, 
Uh, most Italians know it as Il Milionis, uh, the million. Uh, some people say it's because of the million lies that are in it. Uh, I'm not sure why. Um, but it becomes an international best bestseller, and for the next two years, that becomes what people know about the Far East. Or next, I'm sorry, the next two centuries, that's what people know about the Far East. Marco Polo's travels and what he wrote about. Uh, he died in 1324. Now, where was Venice at war with? Genoa. Genoa. Where was Columbus from? Genoa. Oh, Genoa. This is a copy of, this is Christopher Columbus's copy of Marco Polo's travels. And there's he's handwriting notes in the margins here. Oh, you know, this is, you know, and he's tying things together with scripture and with other geographical things he's learning. And he's making and this went with him everywhere in his travels. You don't take a lot of stuff with you when you go for a you know a year-long journey, but he took Marco Polo's journal with him because um, he's going where Marco Polo was, right? Second, John Mandeville. You guys heard about John Mandeville? The Greek explorer? Set a journey and took him through Africa and Asia. When he returned in 1355, he told fantastic tales of strange peoples in faraway lands. Like Marco Polo, he went to Jerusalem, down into Egypt, then over into China where he served for the Khan. The travels of Sir John Mandeville was widely circulated. It was translated into every language in, in Europe, which was a lot. Uh, the problem is, the travels of Sir John Mandeville was a complete fake. In fact, most scholars say, God never existed. I mean, he's a made-up character. Uh, the author took some legends and fables and stories from all over the place and wove them together. He tells about men with the, the heads of dogs or ears like elephants or feet so big they could lay down and hold them over them like an umbrella, you know, when it rained or keep the sun off them. And people believe this stuff. Uh, oddly enough, this was translated, this was more widely read than Marco Polo's travels. Partly because it's so fantastic, right? Uh, and people believe this more than they believe Marco Polo's. Because they just had this view of the world from, you know, the strange people on the other side of the world. Well, what must you be like to live on the flip side of the world? So people believe this. And it was partly a travelogue, like Polo, but it was partly a spiritual journey as well. A spiritual travelogue. The author wrote, Each good Christian man who is able and has the means should set himself to conquer our inheritance, this land of Jerusalem, chase out those who are unbelievers. So he traveled to Jerusalem where the Muslims were in charge and said, you know, every good Christian should devote himself to changing that aspect. One event. Oh, there's a book. The event. Constantinople. We've talked about this briefly already. Constantinople was the capital of the Eastern Roman Empire. Uh, Rome was sacked the first time in 410. About 50 years later, the entire Western Roman Empire just pretty much disintegrated as we saw. But the Eastern Empire survived for a thousand years, and Constantinople was its capital. Uh, its stone walls were 15 feet thick, up to 100 feet high. It was the home to, as we talked about, Hagia Sophia, the most famous church in all Christendom at this point. And because of its unique architectural structure, the dome with two half domes on the sides, it created the largest indoor space in the world at that point. We think like a Rome Stadium today. And that's what you had there in Hagia Sophia. So it was a very famous place. Survived for a thousand years. But, 1453, Mehmet led the Ottoman Turks, Mehmet the Conqueror led the Ottoman Turks against Constantinople using a new technology. Okay, we talked about how, how they use cannon, small cannon, some battles. He's using heavy artillery. He's bringing these massive, massive cannon in, and he's lining them up, and he camps outside. 69 cannon pound the city walls for 53 days. Load, fire, load, fire, load, fire. Nothing can withstand that. Um, and what's the distance of a longbowman? 200 yards. Well, now they can get 500 yards away and just fire at will, complete safety, right? making Longbowmen kind of obsolete uh, when you got this. And so, fired upon the city until the walls fell on May 29th, Monday, right? May 29th, 1453. The great church of Hagia Sophia became a mosque. 
Now, Constantinople was cosmopolitan center, a major gateway between the east and the west. Genoa, during the battle, Genoa, sent a, because they were trading partners with Constantinople, sent a ship of 700 soldiers to help defend the city. But it was no match for the 70,000 soldiers that Mehmet brought with him to attack the city. And so most of the uh, Genoese were, were killed. Uh, one important figure fled in battle. He was injured. Uh, so with Constantinople in the hands of the Ottoman Turks now, the trading routes to the east are cut off. The prices of spices, and they're just getting used to this, these things. Trade opened up, spices and silks and so forth. And now all of a sudden the prices shoots up. People can't afford to get those. Not only that, but Constantinople was on the route to Jerusalem. We saw how in the Fourth Crusade, 1202, they were on their way to attack Jerusalem. They stopped over for a weekend in Constantinople and said, hey, while we're here, why don't we sack the city? And so the, the Crusaders sacked Constantinople in 1204 instead of going all the way to Jerusalem. Uh, so it, it's on that route. Well, now, not only is Jerusalem in the hand of the Muslims, Constantinople, the great eastern empire, the great center of the church, is now in the hand of Muslims. Something has to be done. Enter... Christopher Cologne. Where is he from? Genoa. Genoa. Right? Columbus was two years old when, when Constantinople fell. Born in 15, 1451, Constantinople fell in 1453. Genoa sent 700 soldiers, you know, uh, well-trained, well-armed leading men to go protect the city. And most of them didn't come back. He grew up hearing the stories of the brave Genoese who went off to fight the Muslims. And and were killed in battle against them. This was, this was the world he grew up in. Born in 1451 to a middle class merchant. I see a pattern here. If you want to be a great person, you need to have like a upper middle class dad who has a lot of money and not much character, barely. Uh, his mother named him Cristoforo, which is important. It means Christ bearer. The story is told of a, of a man named Reprovus, I'm sure I pronounce it. It was a legend that he carried the small child across the river. And as he's carrying this small chase of peg, and as he carries a small child, the child gets heavier and heavier and heavier, and Reprobus realizes he's carrying the weight of the entire world. Suddenly it dawns on him, he's carrying the Christ child, who will carry the weight of the world. And so in return for carrying the Christ child across the river, he is made a saint, Saint Christopher, the Christ bearer, who bear, bore Christ across the river. You know, Christopher Columbus is named after that, that saint, Christ bearer. He learned to sail at a young age. By the time he's 21, he's captain in a ship of his own, making journeys of an increasing distance away from Genoa, the homeland. He gets up into Ireland. He goes around Spain, up, I guess, your direction, like this, around Spain, up into Ireland there. And uh, he's shown the bodies of two people who washed ashore. And they're Asians, a man and a woman. Now they're dead, but the currents carried an Asian man and a woman to Ireland. That must mean you can go that direction, east, and get to China. Hmm. At the age of 28, he married Philippa Moniz, the daughter of an Italian noble. A year later, their son Diego was born. Not far from her house was a Franciscan monastery. Columbus would spend a lot of his time talking to the Franciscans, learning about their theology, reading their books about geography, um, using their library to study. They're well known for their missionary zeal, as we've seen, going around the world and telling people about Christ, uh, saving the lost. And these particular Franciscans at this point had been influenced by an apocalyptic view that was very common at that time. A guy named Joaquim de, de Fiore, uh, he had this apocalyptic vision uh, where the world was living in three stages. And we were finishing up the second stage, about to enter the third stage. The Franciscans were bought into this and believed it. Also influenced not just by Francis, the Franciscans, but St. Augustine. Because Columbus had read his Augustine, and Augustine talked about how the world will last for 7,000 years, and oh, look, we're ending up this period, moving into that period, and he starts to calculate it up. Columbus figures out, you can see it in his writings, there's 155 years left before the world ends. 7,000 years long, 155 years left. There's a lot to do between now and the end of the world. 
because we have to convert these nations, we have to convert a bunch of Gentiles, we have to conquer Jerusalem and take it back. He sees himself as part of this grand apocalyptic scheme to win the world before the world comes to an end. This is not a journey about getting his name in the textbooks or getting a lot of gold. This is about the end of the world and bringing in the kingdom of God. He began to inter gather information from geographers and mathematicians who argued that it may be possible to reach the east by going west. Uh, currently, the Portuguese, uh, are we talking about this tomorrow? Yeah. Portuguese in exploration, and they're going out, they're trying to reach the, the east by going around Africa, Vasco da Gama, and they're making further and further journeys around Africa until they finally pass the, the Cape of Good Hope here. And they, they think they can make it there. So Columbus goes to the king of Portugal, Joao II, and uh, <coughs> says, you know, presents this idea about going to the east by way of going to the east by way of going west. And Joao says, hey, well, you know, we're making good progress already. I've got my men out exploring Africa. I think within the next couple of years we're going we're to make that. So Joao says, no, thank you. We're going to stick with our strategy. So where does he go next? He goes to Spain. So we talked about how. Castile and Aragon are two separate nations or two separate countries. They, they merged with the marriage of Ferdinand and Isabella and now kind of forming a new place. There was no Spain before. Now there's a, a united Spain. Um, by the way, it's, it's during this time his son or his wife dies, leaving him in charge of his son, poor old son, Diego. Uh, so Isabella of Castile married uh, Ferdinand of Aragon, joined the two <coughs> kingdoms. And so he's going to make his pitch to them. So he goes, to, he stays at a Franciscan monastery, La Rabida, where he stayed for several months doing research, waiting for his opportunity to talk to the new king and queen. Today there's a statue of Columbus at La Rabida, a place where he stayed, a place where he launched from his journey. Finally, he had an opportunity to make his case to Ferdinand and Isabella. So let's kind of you know, skip ahead here a bit and say, what was his point? What was he trying to accomplish? Why was he undertaking this journey? It was not to prove the world was round. Everybody knew that. Uh, Claudius Ptolemy wrote about that extensively in the first century AD. Uh, any educated person in the Middle Ages knew the world was round. That was the issue. The issue was can you get to the can you get to the east by going west? Is that possible? He wanted to reach the Indies. Uh, this is a map of uh, Mar Martellus just right before Columbus left. And notice, if you're here in, if you're leaving from Spain, and you want to reach China, that looks like a pretty short jaunt, doesn't it? <laughs> and this is how they saw the world. I'm just going to get my boat and go there, and look, all of a sudden I pop out over here. I'm going to head Japan and China. And that's what Columbus was expecting. Uh, he calculated the distance. Oops. Oh, go back one, please. So calculate the distance from... The Azores, which have already been explored, to modern-day Japan, yeah, a couple thousand miles. That's not a hard journey to make. We should be able to do this. Uh, but why do you want to make the journey? Well, he's in search of riches, especially gold. Uh, but even there, there's a purpose behind the gold. It's not just to get rich. He went needed to pay back Ferdinand and Isabella and finance further trips. But the gold was a means to an end. He says, gold is a metal most excellent above all others, and the gold treasures are formed. And he who has it makes and accomplishes whatever he wishes in the world and finally uses it to send souls into paradise. He doesn't mean kill people. He means evangelize. His ultimate goal was to finance a crusade to retake Jerusalem. And to do that, he would need gold, lots of gold, and some allies. So in a letter he wrote to the monarchs, Fernando and Isabel, he said this, He's talking about the great Khan of China, referring back to the tales of Marco Polo, and how many times the Khan and his predecessors had sent to Rome and asked for men learned in our holy faith, that they might instruct him in it, and how the Father, Holy Father never provided those. And thus so many people were lost, falling into idolatry and accepting false and harmful religions. And your highnesses, as Catholic Christians and princes, lovers and promoters of a holy Christian faith, See, Tim talked about Spain being a Catholic country, Catholic uh, kingdom now. That you thought of sending me, Cristobal Colon, to see how their conversion to our holy faith might be undertaken. And you commanded I should go, not to, not 
go to the east by land, by which way it's customary to go, go by the route to the west, by which route we do not know for certain that anyone has previously passed. I think we can go west, reach the east, we can convert the people there and trade at the Khan. And here's where he's thinking. You've got Islam down in here, controlling you know, the whole Middle East era, but if I can go to the Far East and convert the Khan and his vast armies to Christianity, oh look, Christian West, Christian East, we can easily take Islam at that point. That's his goal. To make allies in China to help him take Jerusalem back for Christianity. But to do that, he needs, he needs lots of gold. He has to convert, he mentions that uh, first, you know, Fernando Isabella said, well, talk to our advisors. You know, we've got learned men, see if they think it's possible. And he tries to convince them of it. And one of the passages he uses is 2 Ezra 6.32. Everybody turn that in your Bible, will you? <laughs> On the third day thou didst command the waters to be gathered together in the seventh part of the earth. Six parts thou didst dry up and keep so that some of them might be planted and cultivated and be of service before thee. Two things are important here. First of all, according to this passage, how much of the earth is land? Six sevenths, right? Not one third, I think we know it to be today. Six sevenths of the world is land. We mean the, the water, the ocean is pretty small. Second Esdras, that's in the Apocrypha, Stupigrapha. Not in our Bibles, but if you're a Catholic, it's in your Bible. So this is scripture for him. And so he's using this to argue for, uh, look, the, the ocean can't be that hard to cross. Because the word earth is only one seventh water. Uh, Isabella uh, was preoccupied with establishing their, their true faith in the homeland. Uh, to mention, first of all, it meant driving the Moors out of Granada. So Castile and Aragon are now united. We've got all the, the Moors, the Muslims in Granada, and they're trying to drive them out and reclaim Granada, reconquista, reconquering the area of Spain. Finally, on March 30th, 1492, well, they, they drove them out in 1492, in January. A couple months later, in March of 1492, they got rid of the Muslims. Who's next? Jews, Jews yeah. They got rid of the Muslims from their land. Now when you get rid of the Jews, it'll be a pure Christian nation. So in March, they, March 30th, you've got three months. Make up your mind. Convert or get out. And so the Jews left. Summer of 1492. Also, the summer of 1492, August 3rd, Columbus leaves. Still not about the same time as the Jews are, are leaving there. He's given three ships, 90 men. Uh, Nina Pinta Santa Maria, as it says in the book there, these were not the original names of the ships, they're kind of re renamed by some of the men. Uh, the, the Nina was perhaps 70 feet, little girl, smaller ship, about 70 feet long. So just a little bit smaller in this room, maybe from that edge to this edge, about the length of the Nina. 90 men on three ships, about 30 people per ship. So let's just say we closed those doors and locked it and said, nobody can leave this room for a month. Yeah? How would you feel about that? Um, and well, they don't even know how long it's going to be, right? They just know they're getting on a trip. They're not sure how long this is going to take. Uh, so this took some courage. Yeah, so they're, they're sailing on the seas. He laid over the Canary Islands to make some repairs, take on some supplies, and then set out to the unknown on September 6th, going further west than they had before. After about a month at sea, they're going around restless, as you would too, being in this room locked up for a month. And they, they're starting to... And they know turning around is really kind of pointless now, because they'll never make it back. But they're kind of... They're talking against Columbus, and he kind of says, well, all right, give me three more days... If we don't find land in three more days, we'll turn back around. Two more days, August or October 12th, they, they set land, a small island. There have been several suggested places, um, but most commonly is what he called San Salvador, the uh, Savior. They set anchor there uh, on the island. The island begins to fill up with naked villagers, islanders. Columbus puts on his armor, carries a, a party ashore with a royal banner and two flags emblazoned with green crosses on them. And the natives are friendly, they're completely naked. Columbus wrote, I, in order that they would be friendly to us, and because I recognize they were a people who would be better freed from error 
and converted to our holy faith by love than force. To some of them I gave small red caps and glass beads which they put on their chests and many other things of small value in which they took so much pleasure and became so much our friends that it was a marvel. This was his strategy. When he would stop a new place, it wasn't, I mean, okay, yes, he would claim it for Spain. This is now Spanish land. But he wasn't, okay, we're going to slaughter all his people. He would trade and barter with them and try to establish friendly relationships with them. He seemed to really admire these people and he wanted to, to convert them. But he, remember, he's looking for wealth. He's looking for advanced civilization of the great Khan. This is not what he expected. Obviously, this is not the place. Uh, so this must be one of those thousands of islands Marco Polo wrote about off the coast of China, Japan, and all that area. So he continued onward. Uh, he explored island after island, discovering new peoples. Each place he exchanged trinkets with the people. Uh, he didn't find much gold, didn't find the Khan. Um, but he said, I do not detect in them any religion. And I believe they will become good Christians very quickly because they are very good understanding. They're very intelligent, they're very kind, they make great Christian people. He explored Cuba. Uh, yeah, oh, so over here he gets the coast of Cuba. He thinks, okay, this is it. I've reached Japan. Because it kind of fit the description in some ways. Um, but then he figured out eventually that, that it's not Japan. He goes east to Hispaniola. That's what he calls it. Little, little Spain. And uh, it, it's there that the tragedy happens. Um, he traveled on to there and he lands at uh, this east of Capetian, where I've spent a lot of time to be part of the Capetian. Uh, on Christmas Eve, the flagship, Santa Maria, runs aground. And the guy was sleeping at the wheel and ran aground, and the waves are beating it, and the thing's falling apart. They can't save it. So very hurriedly, they unload the ship, they unload the man, everything is saved, everybody's saved, but the ship is a loss. They're down to two ships. <coughs> They can't take everybody back on just one ship. And so what he did was, he left 39 or 40 men there. They, they took the wood from the ship, and they built a small fort there on the coast. And he left about 39, 40 men, depending on how you count it, and said, I'll come back for you later. How do you feel about that? <laughs> yeah. uh, but they're, they're, they're friendly people. Here he'd establish a relationship with the one of the local kings. He established a good relationship. The king assured them, "We'll take care of your people while they're gone. Nothing bad will happen. Trust us in this. We'll, we'll be fine." And he wrote a letter at that time to Ferdinand and Isabella, saying, "I'm going to return the next year to this land, and when I do, I'll find a barrel of gold that these men left behind would have acquired by exchange. They'll trade with the locals. They'll acquire a barrel of gold." And that day would have found the gold mine in the spicery. And in things of such quantity that the sovereigns, before three years are over, you will undertake to go and conquer the Holy Sepulchre. The Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem. For thus I urge your highness to spend all the profits of this my enterprise on the conquest of Jerusalem. So his first journey, he's saying, I'm going to come back, there's going to be gold here, and we're going to go back and take Jerusalem. That's the purpose for his trips. Sailed along the coast of Hispaniola with his two ships for a couple of weeks. Then mid-January, sent off back, back to the homeland to reach Spain. The trip was dangerous. The ship almost sank in a storm. Uh, on March 4th, he thought he might drown. He penned a letter to the sovereign just in case he didn't make it. And he said this, That through the divine grace of him who is the fount of every victory, and every good thing, and who grants favor and victory to all who follow his way, Within seven years, I will return to your highnesses and give you enough money to pay for 5,000 knights and 50,000 soldiers for the conquest of Jerusalem. The ultimate goal behind your decision to undertake this enterprise. That's Jared, it. How did they get mail back to him? <laughs> <laughs> they had to take it on the ship. Yeah, you know, right. Yeah, he did actually, he did actually basically put a note in a barrel and, and so, you know, in case the ship went down and hopefully this would make it, but they never never found that. He records that he did that, but they never found that one. So if you happen to be out on the coast and run across a barrel with a note from Columbus in it, it will become very important. Uh, it's the Ides of March. Uh, on the Ides of March, seven months and 11 days after it departed, Columbus brought the ship back into Spain. News quickly spread of discoveries, but of course he's announcing he discovered what? Not the New World. 
I've been to India. Well, okay, I've been to the Indian Islands, you know, the surround there. Um, and so, they, the, and he brought back with him some of the natives to prove it. I mean, look, this is proof. Dark skin, different language, different culture. Now, some people would say he took slaves. It's not the way he described it. He took willing people who went back. To, and these people were going to be trained and learn the language. So when he went back in the second trip, they could be translators for them. Uh, they weren't sold in the slave market. So how do you read that? Is, you, know, you can read it in different ways. Uh, this is the first time the word Indios appears in print, talking about these natives that he brought with him, people from India. Natives reports to the royals, uh, and then soon began making his preparations for the second trip. After all, he left the men behind in Hispaniola, right? He, he can't delay too long. Now, in light of all these discoveries, the Spanish and the, the Portuguese came up with the Treaty of Torcedilla, which said that many land discovered uh, 700, 370 leagues uh, west of the Cape Islands would belong to Spain. Anything east of that would belong to uh, Portugal. So therefore later when Brazil is discovered, it's east of that line. So Brazil belongs to the Portuguese, not to Spain. That's why they speak Port Portuguese in Brazil now. Second voyage. Quite different than the first. Instead of three ships, he now has a fleet of 17 ships. And more than a thousand men, almost fifteen hundred men are with it. There are horses, there are livestock, there are pigs and chickens. And chickens that stick under your armpits in case you get black plague, I think. Yeah. <laughs> so three Franciscans and a friar are sent with them to help, you know, convert the, the people in the islands. Along the journey are Diego, his brother, uh, Ponce de Leon, who discovered Florida later on. Members of the original crew, so that tells you something about the kind of captain he was, they wanted to sail with him again. Uh, and the natives, who he brought back with him from the first trip. He's now taking them back with him as translators. They left October 13th, uh, 1493. Wow. Mm. <laughs> Made a crossing in 21 days, which is amazing, even by today's standards. With all of our, you know, uh, modern technology and map making skills, make that trip in 21 days with a sailing ship is, is difficult. On the way to Hispaniola, he landed in some of the uh, uh, Virgin Islands, discovered 20 new islands on the way including Puerto Rico. He arrived at the community that he built. Oh, by the way, the ship ran ground Christmas Eve. They took the wood from the ship and made a fort, so they called the fort Navidad, which means Christmas. Yeah, I mean, so this is Fort Christmas. Um, and, and so he returns to Navidad there. But as they get there, they see an awful sight. They see bodies floating in the water. The 40 men they left behind, not one of them is alive. Some of them have been beheaded. Uh, some, well, they had their eyes plucked out. And uh, it, fairly recently, too, by the looks of things. They're like, oh man, what, what happened? They talked to some of the locals, and there's kind of some competing stories here. You know, we tried to, you know, the men just, they got, they got greedy. They started thinking they could do whatever they wanted to. They would take our food. They would take our women. They would take our gold. We tried to stop them, but you know they, they just wouldn't listen. So finally, war broke out. Um, so the first bloodshed had occurred of the encounter between East and West. There'd be a lot more to come after this. Uh, clearly, Columbus pressed on. You know, he doesn't want to stay there. It's not a place to start a community after this disaster. Uh, so he established a new settlement, a place called Isabella. Uh, but the people there that he took with him to start a new life, they, well, this is hard work. Starting from scratch, building, you know, planting seeds and building buildings and everything we need. Can we get these natives to do this? I didn't come here to work all this, you know, I'm a noble. I didn't come here to do physical work. So a month after arriving, 12 of the 17 ships returned to Spain. Uh, taking some people who said, this is too tough. Some said they want supplies. You know, rather than trying to create our own, we need more supplies from Spain. So 12 ships went back to go up with supplies. Uh, with those ships, he sent back cinnamon, pepper, cotton, parrots, and uh, 26 slaves they had captured. These are slaves. Because in commission the second voyage, Isabel and Ferdinand said this. He said they said that the settlers, this was their part of their instructions, the settlers are to treat the said Indians very well and lovingly and abstain from doing them any injury, arranging that both people should hold much conversation and intimacy. 
each serving the others to the best of their ability. And if any person should mistreat the said Indians in any manner whatsoever, the Admiral, as Viceroy and Governor of their Highness, shall punish them severely by virtue of the authority vested in him by their majesties for this purpose. So, they expected them to treat the natives well. The exception was, if somebody fought against the Spaniards, well then, you know, this is just war now, right? If they're going to make war on us, then of course we could kill them or take them slaves. And so there were rumors of cannibalistic tribes that even some of the islanders feared. Um, and, and so these cannibals, they would be fought against Columbus and his men, and they were taken prisoners and taken captive to be sold as slaves. They're called the Caribs, as in Caribbean. Uh, on the ships were some English nobles uh, who complained about Columbus and after the first journey and the way the affairs were handled. So Columbus left his brother Diego in charge while he went to uh, of the community. Well, he went to explore further west, explore Cuba. I think he perhaps was Asian mainland, uh, but supplies were running low. Food is running low, people were getting ill, including Columbus himself. So they returned to Isabella. They rested and made repairs and then headed back to Spain in June of 1496. And by this time, at the end of the second journey, second voyage, he started wearing the robe of a Franciscan friar. A brown, simple robe with a rope belt. And that was to become what he wore most of the time from that point on. Gave instructions for him to be buried in a Franciscan friar. friar's robe. Bet you didn't learn that in high school, right? Third voyage, two years later. So now again, with six ships, 330 people, three of the ships were to go to straight, straight to Hispaniola where they needed supplies and needed to you know, restock with some things. But when they arrived, they found that things were not good. I mean, the settlers had formed a rebellion against Columbus's brother and the strict rules they had set up. Not everybody wants to live by strict rules, apparently. Meanwhile, Columbus took three other ships to explore further south. He hadn't located the con yet, through all these areas of gold. He ran into Trinidad, and the ship was nearly swamped by an enormous flow of water, which came out from this area down here. We know Venezuela, we know it as the Orinoco River. Um, but Columbus was convinced that it was the rivers flowing from the Garden of Eden. He realized this point. Interesting. He realized that the waters coming out of here were too. The rivers were too massive and mighty to come off an island. This is not an island river. This has got to be a continent. Okay, so there's some dispute here. Does he realize, he realizes he's on a continent. Does he realize this is a new continent? Or is he thinking it's Asia? I don't know. He began to theorize where things get strange. He began to theorize the world is not round. It has kind of a nipple on one end, like a pear. And that's where the Garden of Eden was located. And so you get all kinds of medieval stuff going on here, middle Christianity, about how like, the world was flooded, the Garden of Eden was not flooded because it was higher than everything else. The Garden of Eden almost touches the heavens. And he's saying, the world is shaped like this, and the Garden of Eden is up here. And from the Garden of Eden, the four mighty rivers flow, the Tigris, the Euphrates, the Amazon, and the Ganges, all come out of the Garden of Eden. And he thinks he's found one of those four rivers. But you can only gain access to the paradise by God allowing you to do so. And so I, I wouldn't dare do that at this point. I couldn't make it up there, and you know, God has given me permission to do that. But he thinks he's on the edge of the earthly paradise, the Garden of Eden, which still exists. Um, skip that, skip that, skip that. Okay. So he's exploring the coast of, uh, of Venezuela which is the first time he reaches the mainland, by the way. Uh, he's in poor health, uh, so he goes back to Hispaniola, uh, refines a, a rebellion going under Francisco Roldan. He tries to make peace with the rebels. Uh, finally, they come to some kind of agreement just to get things over with, and they're transported back to Spain. And through it all, Columbus is relying upon his faith in God. God was seeing through all this. He quotes Scripture constantly. Um, Isabella sent uh, an investigator at this point to investigate all these stories about Columbus being a bad administrator, which he was. He was a bad administrator. He didn't handle these people well always. And so she sends an investigator to go check things out. And the investigator kind of turns on Columbus. And he takes Columbus back in chains, locks him up on a ship, and sends him back to Spain. The man who discovered the place 
Now go back in chains. And then when they get back there, they offer to take the chains off. He says, no, leave the chains on until I appear before the queen. I want, you know, not until I'm pronounced innocent, because he's trying to make a point here. The hearings were held. Columbus was set free. His belongings were restored. Although some of his titles, uh, Viceroy and Admiral, the uh, he still remained Admiral. He was not the governor of the whole new world now. His titles were given to others. During this time, he put together two books. First is a book of privileges. It's a collection of all the legal documents that the monarchs had made to him. Promises and all the legal documents about his trips. Here's what you said would happen. and This has been notarized. And You said that I and my family for generations or forever would receive this. And return. He's put this all together in a book. It was his prized possession. Because here's what is owed to me and my family forever. Because This is what we promised him. Book of Privileges. He also put together another book called the Book of Prophecies. Uh, filled with prophecies and verses dealing with Jerusalem and the Holy City and the end times. He quotes from Psalms, Chronicles, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Mike, Nahum, <laughs> Zephyr, and Zechariah. Couldn't get those in. As well as Baruch and Ecclesiasticus from the Stupigrapha. He saw his discoveries as fulfillment of the prophecies of the Old Testament. All the prophecies were looking towards this, this great time. He sent a copy of this book to Pope Alexander VI, along with a description of what he discovered. Reminding the people he'd taken this enterprise in order to win over the, the Holy Sepulchre and win it back to the church. He also sent a copy of this book to the sovereigns, monarchs, Isabella and Ferdinand, warning them, the world's coming to an end, 155 years left. Um, you know, so... We need to get the program here. Don't dilly dally. Don't get caught up in their things. Fernandez and Isabella are thinking about you know their kingdom and so forth. And Columbus is saying, think about the kingdom of God because time is running out. Now this stuff is all new, by the way. Uh, when you went to high school, when I went to high school, this hadn't been translated into English yet. It's only the last decade or so that the Book of Prophecies has been translated into English. Uh, finally, after two years, Columbus was given permission to make his fourth voyage. Four ships, 135 men, including his brother, Bartholomew, 13-year-old son, Ferdinand. Uh, he left the Canary Islands in 1502. He's now 51 years old, and he's in poor health. People didn't live as long. He's had a hard life living out in the ocean sea, um, but he was glad to be getting back to travel one more time. He knew this would be his last journey. Hurricane forced him to seek a refuge in Hispaniola, even though he'd been forbidden to return there. Uh, the governor refused to allow him to, to come ashore, so he had to anchor in the harbor there in Hispaniola while the hurricane came. Meanwhile, the governor sent off a fleet of ships back to Spain, carrying all kinds of treasures and people with it. A fleet of 29, or 30 ships. 29 of them sank in the hurricane. Including vast amounts of gold, and the rebel rolled on. Um, so, yeah, you could, you could find a lot of interesting things. 500 men lost their lives in that. Columbus made a brief stop at Jamaica, and they went on to land in Honduras. He's now he's Central America exploring that. He spent two months exploring the coastline of Central America. Nicaragua, Costa Rica, Panama. In December, they encountered a fierce storm which threatened to sink the ship. And Columbus said the men are so worn out from fighting it that they've longed for death. Like some of my students after a long class period. Kill us now! In April, he headed north to Cuba, tried to make it in Hispaniola, but the ships were literally falling apart. They'd been through so much, and uh, sea worms, which are kind of crustacean actually, or eating through the wood, the ships couldn't make it. And so in 1503, they found themselves stranded in Jamaica. Now you're thinking, there are worse places to be stranded, right? Avon, come enjoy the sun, the beach. But he and his men are stranded there, 116 people, no food, all the supplies they can salvage from the ship, and no way to send a letter home, you know? How do you communicate to other people? We're trapped here. So eventually, a couple of his guys get in canoes and paddle the distance. 105 miles against the current to Hispaniola, then they had to keep going a total of 350 miles to get to Santo Domingo. So 350 miles in a canoe to try to get help. They arrive. And by the way, in, in the meantime, Columbus's men are trained the natives. 
and this is fun. But after seven months, names are getting tired. You know, Columbus is running out of things to trade with them. His IOUs are kind of running short. We keep providing guys with food, but you Europeans eat a lot. And so the natives are getting tired of this. So February 29, 1504, Columbus sent a message to local chiefs and said, you know what? God is very angry at you because you are not cooperating with us and helping to take care of his men. And as a sign of his anger, the moon will be swallowed up in blood. He knew from his astrological charts there would be a lunar eclipse that night. And so he called the chief in and said, God's angry. And as the sun came, or the sun, as the moon came out that evening and dirt turned red as the eclipse, they are terrified. You know, oh no, we have angered God. He said, I will pray to God for you. You know, that he might have mercy on you. Goes back to his cabin. You know, he's waiting, 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 because he knows how long it's going to take. Comes back out. God said that if you continue to provide for us and care for us, He will forgive you. And as a sign, He will restore the moon. And the moon starts to come out like, oh, yes, here, have some food, have a pizza, have whatever you want. Well, and stay provided for the men that way. Uh, I think it's interesting coming with the, uh, with the solar eclipse coming up here later this summer. Help finally arrived June 29th. Had to be marooned for a year and five days. Uh, he and his men. They bid farewell to Jamaica and went back to Santo Domingo, rebuilt the ship, prepared for the final leg of the journey. Got home November 7, 1504. Excited to meet Isabella, tell about the discoveries. Unfortunately, she died a few weeks later. November 26, 1504. King Ferdinand, who's never on board as much as Isabella was. She was a passionate Christian you know, warrior here. Ferdinand, he had other things in mind. And so Fernand's like, yeah, that was that was her thing, not mine. Uh, he took away some of the privileges belonging to Columbus. And so he spent his final years writing letters to lawyers and anybody who would listen. Look, they promised me this if I went my journeys. and This is what I did, and they haven't fulfilled their promises. He begged for money for the men. All the men who made the journey with me, they, you owe them the money for the journey, the promise, their wages, and so forth. 1505, he sent a letter by a friend of his named... Amerigo Vespucci. Hmm. Columbus died the following year. Oh, there's, there's the eclipse, by the way. Yeah. Columbus died the following year, 1506. Surrounded by two of his sons, his two sons, and his closest companions. He's buried in a simple brown robe of Franciscan. One more clue to his motivation his signature. At the end of his first voyage, this is a letter he wrote back to the monarchs. And at the bottom, see his signature there? Right here. It, it, it looks kind of like a design, like a ship in full mast. But the letters there, S, S, A, S, X, M, Y. But it's clear. And this is how he signed his name from this point on, after the first journey. And he, he instructed his children. He's exactly how to, to sign the name. This is very important. This is very well thought out. It's very clearly symbolic. We just don't know why. <laughs> We do know some of it. His name... Christopher Rind means Christ bearer. You know, the, the Cairo, we talked about that, right? The Cairo for Christ, Christ parents bearer. He is a Christ bearer. He is one to carry Christ across the ocean seas to the, to the new land. The rest of this stands for something. Uh, the most common interpretation is servus sum altissimi salvatoris Christe Mari yes, Servant of the Most High Savior, Christ Mary and Joseph. And then the Christ bearer, his name. This is how he always signed his name. We just don't know exactly what it means. They're very important to his self-identity. All right. Now we're wrapping up. His four voyages right here. Very, very colorful uh, voyages. Remember I mentioned the name of Amerigo Vespucci? Another explorer, friend of Columbus, an acquaintance of Columbus. He went on to explore the Americas. In 1503, he published a pamphlet in which he claimed had discovered a new part of the world, a, a new continent, a fourth part of the world. This was shocking, because people knew about Columbus's discoveries of some islands and the Indies and so forth. But there's a whole other continent we didn't know about? Are you kidding me? <laughs> and so people were more excited about America Vespucius' letter than they were about Columbus's letter. Columbus's four voyages, he never reached the, the North American mainland. 
This was uh, Vespucci's voyages, where he was a first, I mean, he got down to South America, crossed the equator, first knew that, explored large chunks of South America. That's um, 1504, 1503, the letter came out. Um, so, notice where the journeys are. They're while Columbus had journeys are taking place. The next year, they, they came out with the, they found a letter, how convenient, 1504, which claimed that Vespucci had actually made four journeys. And one of the first journey was exploring the North American continent, all the way up and down the coast. And the year was 1499, before Columbus reached the mainland. And here's what's interesting. Scholars have long known that that letter is a forgery. Probably not even written by Vespucci himself. Probably written by somebody else claiming you know, in his name. But the letter was very popular for a couple of years before they figured out it was a forgery. Everybody read it. Oh, look! Merigo Vespucci discovered a new continent before Columbus did. And one of the people who heard about this was a map maker in Germany named Martin Bossemuller. He's making maps that go around, around the world. And he makes a map here, and for the first time, you have a new continent that had never been on a map before, with an ocean on the other side of it before you get to the east. So this new continent is run by an ocean. And the first time... The word America appears on the map. Thousands, yeah, thousands of copies of this map have been produced. Only one exists in the world today. It's right here. Yeah. No, come on. Yeah. And this is a, a copy of it right down here. If you look at it, it's, it's hard to read the print because it's small. The actual map was purchased by the U.S. Library of Congress in 2001 for $10 million. It has 12 panels. This is like one panel. So you put these 12 panels together, it makes a huge wall map. Right? But it's the first map that mentions the new land as America. Well, a couple years later, Waltz Mueller realizes this was a forgery, this was a mistake. He, the next map should come out, just call this Terra Incognita, unknown land. But so many copies of the map had gone out, people started calling it America. Right? Um, this one request we have made to the, well, let's give that. Um, so according to Bartholomew de Casas, who traveled with Columbus, he, was not, he wasn't a huge fan of Columbus always, but he was an honest observer. He gave the impression that uh, yes, he or she you know, wanted people to believe that he alone had discovered the New World. It's apparent then how much injustice was done to the Admiral Christopher Columbus. It was more his due that the mainland should be called Columbus, de Colón, or Colombia, after the man who discovered it, or Tierra Santa, or Tierra de Gracia, which he himself named, thanks be to God, or Holy Land. Not America, after America of this beauty. So by some historical fluke, we consider ourselves Americans today. Probably should think of ourselves as Colombians. That's better than Colons, right? <laughs> we should be in Colombians, but it could be worse, because... After all, the tendency is to name countries after the last name of explorers. So, Vespucia, you know, God bless Vespucia. <laughs> yeah, I don't see it either. So, um, so I'm going to go with America on, on that one. Uh, but, yeah, Columbus is the one who, um, I think, I think deserves credit. The, the biggest factor here is Columbus never really came out and say, I discovered a new continent. He said that, there would be no argument. Vespucia is the first one to say, it's a new continent. When we got there first, but Vespucci recognized what it was first. As part of, the, are you going to talk about the Columbian Exchange then tomorrow? Oh, uh, we're really not sure. Okay, so uh, here's the multi-meter map. Uh, Columbian Exchange. This is why I want to talk about it partly because the impact it had on world history is enormous. We got things like tomatoes and peanuts, peanut butter and chocolate and vanilla. I mean, right there, I'm in. Right? <laughs> we wouldn't have those things. Uh, pineapple, corn, you know, all that stuff because of discovering the New World. Uh, turkeys, what did they get? Well, they had no large animals. Al alpaca is the largest thing they had. So, horses, I think of the American West, the horses, cattle, bees, bananas, sugar cane, which grew up, coffee. It's just a massive, now the world has opened up in a whole new way and introduced all kinds of new things to new people. Tobacco, yes, which is actually the biggest crop that came out of there for a long time. 
We also gave them some things like smallpox, you know, plague, tip, uh, typhus, measles, diphtheria, whooping cough. So I think Europeans get the better side of that deal. And, uh, and what? And Daniel. <laughs> yes. <laughs> right? Yeah, so which side of that, you know, ledger do you want to be on in this particular case? Uh, you know, syphilis came about this time, not sure if it went from west to east or east to west. Everybody calls it the disease that came from some other place. You know, if, if you're in England, it's the Frenchman's disease. Right? Uh, so it's, it's, you know, who started it, but we know that syphilis came back with some of the men from Columbus and spread through Europe at that point. Uh, so the climate change changed the history of the world at that point. Uh, Columbus thought he was doing one thing, great for the history of the world, kind of being different than he thought, but it's got a huge impact on all of us Europeans who are in the new world today. Yes? So Columbus never did reach North America. He never reached North America. He uh, died thinking he reached the, in the mainland of China, uh, from what we can tell. Uh, but he never got to, to North America at all. Well, no, it's so all through school. Yeah, see? There you, go back to your teachers and demand your money back. From, yeah. Any other questions? We need to lunch. Yes, sir. So who were the first, I mean, I know the pilgrims come a uh, hundred years, but who were the first people that actually went to North America? Well, John Cabot explores North America quite a bit. Um, and he becomes one of the explorers that's best known for going up on the East Coast. So he, here's the, um, here's a re the reason, yeah. I mean, you also have, we talked about the Vikings, right, explored up in Nova Scotia, that you found them. Just a, a couple of light reading here before lunch. Um, <laughs> mysterious uh, history of Christopher Columbus. This is written for the 500th anniversary of discovery. Uh, 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 so 1992. Just a little bit older now. A very well balanced. Probably a little more academic than some of the others. But a well balanced approach to the study of Columbus. Columbus of Four Voyages. Uh, Lawrence Bergerine. Also wrote about Marco Polo and um, Magellan. He's a good writer. He takes a more negative view of Columbus, you know, more cynical view, taking slaves and being violent and so forth. If you want to study about the religion, the religious motivated motivations for Columbus, Columbus the Quest for Jerusalem by Carol Delaney, she's the one that really opened this up. And uh, some scholars see we're missing a whole side of this. It's very important. Uh, so if you want to read about the religious motivation and what was going on there, this book talks about that background. You want to read about the map, the Wallace and Mueller map, and the whole story behind discovery and exploration and cartography, the fourth part of the world. Fascinating to read. I'm, I'm going to go back and read it again just because it was so much fun talking about all the discoveries and how these things came in what order and, and who gets credit for it. Uh, a couple of books about uh, Haiti. You know, a lot have been written about Haiti after the earthquake, and they all talk about Columbus and the impact he had. When Columbus landed in Haiti, there were, some say, up to a half million Taino people peaceful, loving, tiny people. Within a generation, within 50 years, there was less than 100. Because we know work, slavery, being killed, disease coming in, they just were not resistant to. At one point, one year, 50,000 uh, Tainos killed themselves because they would not submit to the slavery of the cruel Spanish overlords and just jumped off cliffs and killed themselves. So. We need workers, we got them from Africa instead. and brought in West Africans to, to work in Haiti. And that's why Haiti is black today. And then two more books. The Climate Exchange, 1491, by Charles Mann. America's before Columbus. 1493, America's after Columbus. I haven't gotten this one yet. Have you read the 1493 yet? Okay. So that's next on my list. But uh, you want to read about the whole... New World, Old World, Climate Exchange Park, these are two good places to go. Who, who are those by? Charles Mann, M-A-N-N. -N. Mm -hmm. He was the Mayflower. May when? 15 something. Mayflower, oh. they came over. Oh yeah, that, that's much later. 15 something. No, 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 no. 16. No. 16. 16. 16. 20. 20, right. 16, 20, right. Um, yeah, so. Yeah, Plymouth Rock and so forth. No. All right. Yes, sir. I think a lot of the negativity that Columbus has gotten, you know, in more recent uh, books like Howard Zinn and Jared Diamond, is mainly because of the Spanish people associated with Columbus. 
Yeah, yeah, and that's part of it. It's, it's a big picture thing of, okay, maybe Columbus wasn't quite the jerk that some people portray him to be, but the guys who followed him, some of them really were. Not all of them. Yeah, Haiti, I mean, in the same places, they came in and they were cruel, and they would just work people to death, and they didn't care if you died, because they could have placed you the slave just as cheap, you know? And so, there is a lot of bad history going on here. I don't want to sugarcoat that at all. Uh, but what's Columbus's role in that? That's the part that, that I think we need to think about. Good, good question. All right, Gail, you're up. Lunch? Yes? Thank you.